The great way is effortless with no preferences. Surrender, desire, and aversion. Clarity dazzles. So in the spiritual path or on the spiritual path in Buddhism, we use the term the great way to just refer to the path of the Buddha, the path of enlightenment, awakening. The no uh, and the great way is effortless. So this is really a particular word that I'm using in this uh, translation, because if there's effort, then that points us to some sense of self, some personality that is uh, doing something that is intending to take action. Whenever we take action, when that's being generated from our personality perspective, there typically is an expectation of some kind of response. We usually want to get our sense of self mirrored or reaffirmed, our ideas or positions, something about how we hold ourselves, how we view ourselves. We want the other to receive and accurately reflect back to us, mirror back to us. So the great way being effortless would mean then we would be taking action without the functioning, the full functioning of the personality structuring. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. The second line with no preferences. So one of the ways that we maintain our sense of self is through our inner self-talk, our inner narration. The majority of people have a, an ongoing inner narration that is asserting their likes and dislikes as they move through their daily life. I like that car. I don't like that tree. I like that bush. I don't like that person. And so we go through repeating these throughout the day and it lets us continue to reassert, okay, this is who I am because of my likes and dislikes. And so in this stanza, no preferences means we're removing that, we're, we're turning away from or lessening our connection to that part of our system that needs to be asserting the likes and dislikes. The third line, surrender, desire, and aversion. In Buddhism, we believe that people fall into a couple of uh, orientation groups. Two of the groups, one is the, the desire group and the other is the aversion group. The desire folks are wired that if they can get the right stuff, if they can accumulate the right things around them, the comforts, the right people, the right opinions, then everything, their life's going to work well and everything's going to go smoothly. So it's, it's gathering all the, the items that we value. The aversive type is one that takes the opposite approach. If I can keep the bad stuff away, if I can keep the things away that I don't like, that are painful, that are difficult, then that means only good stuff is going to gravitate towards me. So you can see the different approach. One is gathering the good stuff, which we think will keep the items that we don't like, the things we are aversive to away, is the desire approach. And the aversive approach is keep away bad stuff, so push it all away. So surrender, desire, and aversion. Don't try to bring in the good things. Don't try to keep out what you typically consider to be the bad things. And that gives us a kind of neutrality, a kind of openness that we have. And then the last line is clarity dazzles. So when we can relax our preferences, when we can put down even temporarily our drive to orient towards desire or aversion, we're simply with the natural state of the universe with the natural state of the world. And that's where I'm using the line clarity dazzles because there's a kind of sparkle to our visual field, to our perception. And what that's pointing to is the source. In the 
Mahayana, the Zen tradition, we talk about the source of all reality as being the absolute. And that simply means that it's absolute truth, absolute reality. And one of the main functions or, or aspects of the absolute is that it's non-conceptual. So anything that I can say about it, anything you can read about it or hear about the absolute is not going to be entirely accurate because it's a non-conceptual realm or non-conceptual function. And the way that I frame the absolute is that it has two primary functions. The first is unmanifest, which the chief quality is emptiness, as we call it traditionally in Buddhism. I use the word absence, and that is characterized by peacefulness and stillness. And that will invite us into a deep, deep quieting and vast spaciousness when we make contact with that quality, with that function of the absolute. And the other is the, the manifest functioning of the absolute, which is characterized by an unconditioned pure love, a love that loves without condition. It's not something we need to earn. It's not something we can lose. And another quality in the function of the manifest is presence, hereness, nowness, the immediacy of this breath, of this moment, feeling even the quality that sometimes is called beingness by some teachers. So it's feeling the profundity of this moment. And that's particularly true when we're not split between the past, the present, and the future. The past and the future are concepts, they're ideas. They're not here right now. Only this moment is here. This is alive. And so when we're focusing more here in this moment and relaxing our contact with the past and the future, we're more in touch with the presence in this moment, the presence of the absolute. So the sense of self gets developed it gets developed in part when we're young, we come into our living situation, whether it's a birth family or living with some other caregivers. And a lot of it is how we're mirrored, how our caregivers and family relate to us, what they identify about us, what they consider to be our strengths, our weaknesses, what we're particularly skilled at versus unskilled. And so within a family, you'll have people, there's the smart one and the athletic one and the funny one and whatever else, but there's these roles we get assigned. And that's part of the development of our family mirroring back to us who they take us to be. We can also be the one in trouble, the one who's not very bright, the one who's, you know, whatever. And so by getting all this mirroring, it creates a composition within us. And what keeps the sense of self in operation is primarily our belief, our conviction that it's true. And in some ways we hold it as the most true. This is reality. So this is one of the ways that we, that we uh, form a sense of self. And then when we add in our likes and dislikes and our narrative I mentioned earlier, then that's what's creating the sense of self of who I am. And so part of what we're orienting to, what we're going to orient to tonight, and what in Buddhism we orient to is sometimes called no self. And no self simply means a softening or an absence of the ordinary self, the normal sense of me. When that's absent, there still can be full functioning full perception, full engagement with others. We think we need a personality or a sense of self to do all these things, and we don't. It's not actually accurate. So there's a quality called absence of self. I mentioned no self. Experientially, absence of self would be, if I asked you right now, who are you? 
many people would respond with an assertion of the likes and dislikes. I live here, I work here, I have these relationships, I'm this age, uh, and on and on, all the identifiers. And when we're in touch with absence of self, we don't know who we are. If, I, if you were in touch with absence of self in this moment, and I asked you, who are you? Your response would be, I have no idea. That would be the truth. I have no idea who I am. And that's that openness that the absence of self affords. For most people, when they first make contact with absence of self, they quickly move back to the, the ways of asserting the self, the likes and dislikes narration, reminding themselves of all the markers I mentioned earlier of age and occupation, relationship, and geography, all those things. And we learn to develop some comfort, some ease with the absence of self. So when we have times when for whatever reason it relaxes, it's put down, we can simply be with the quality of spaciousness, of vastness, sometimes called the void. We can be in this expanded contact with the absolute. And this eventually over time becomes a uh, more stable quality, the absence of self. In the process of awakening, it's one of the key features of awakening is absence of self, the actual experience of it. Again, I'm not talking about a concept, an idea that, oh yeah, I know that I'm not really, I'm not really the self. That's, that's helpful. But the absence of self is, I can't tell you who I am. I don't even know who I am. So that's the real, the real quality of the absence. So I think what we'll do is, you know, let me pause here and see if there's any questions on the content. Well, Stephen, there was one early question about if you could repeat the reference uh, for the quotes in the beginning. Yeah, the, the, the quote comes from, uh, from my book, Trust and Awakening, and it's a retranslation of the first poem of Zen. The Chinese title is the Zing Zing Ming, which in English is normally translated as faith in mind. And to me, I wanted something more solid than faith. So that's where I, I came up with trust in awakening, where we can uh, really land in that. Uh, Elaine? Unmute. You're unmuted now. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, it takes a little bit to get there. Thank you so much. I came in a little bit late, um, but I had this question. I, I understand about aversion and preference, but somewhere in there, I think you said, um, and I'm interpreting this, like, don't go don't try to avoid the bad or or have preference for the good but that implies that those are concepts right right just so you're so so my, my concern is like do you sort of get to a state where you don't see things as good or bad I mean that sounds a bit dangerous to me mm -hmm. I could see not being attached and not, not like having a personal aversion or preference for one or the other, but still having a sense of something is, is good and something is bad. So yeah. I, I don't know if I'm clearly asking that question, but no, you are. Yeah. Okay. And, thank and, you. And yeah, there, there's a distinction. What I'm making a distinction on is the difference between the concepts of good and bad. You can go to different cultures and what's good and what's bad are going to be slightly different. So it isn't that there's one good and one bad. It's very interpret it's interpreted uh, by our personality material. What I'm saying is that we can relax those things. We can relax the desire and aversion and just allow things to happen. Uh, famous Zen master Dogen said delusion is and I'm paraphrasing, delusion is going out to the 10,000 dharmas, which means going out 
to, and contacting everything we can see and engage with. And enlightenment is allowing the 10,000 dharmas yeah. to contact us. Yeah. So yeah. there's a difference there when we're going out to make meaning versus we're present in the field and we're experiencing everything that's here. But we still have a way of, of knowing what's positive behavior, what's harmonious behavior. Okay. In the okay. Zen tradition, we use the, the precepts, particularly the, the, what are called the three pure precepts, which are to do good, cease from evil, and do good for others. And cease from evil means not doing selfish behavior that you know is going to negatively impact someone else or harm someone else. So, so if we're oriented towards, towards doing, being a benefit of service to others, that's really going to take away the good and bad. Yeah, and it, it seems like in the beginning, at least there are some definitions about what those behaviors might be. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and okay. it's, pe people are not gonna be uh, experiencing absence of self and then running around doing criminal acts because uh, they're going to be informed by the source, by the absolute. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, see. There was another question that came in by Janet. She said, the term no self, are you equating that to universal love, grace, or nirvana? Uh, no. Um, the uh, absence of self is a particular quality uh, in the unmanifest, in the unstructured aspect, the functioning of the absolute. In the, fun in the manifest, in the functioning aspect of the absolute is unconditioned universal love, is pure presence. So those are there. And nirvana is in the absence. We move into the absence, which we'll do, we'll present that tonight. And when we can move into that, we meet peacefulness and stillness. As we take those in, as we open and surrender to those qualities more and more, we, we begin to go offline in that our, our thoughts can slow and eventually stop. Uh, all sense of me will fall away and we'll be left with awareness and consciousness. And as we get closer to cessation, which is an experience highlighted in Theravada Buddhism, then eventually consciousness and awareness shut off. It's a complete blackout uh, experience. There's no sense of anything. There's no perception at all. Cessation is Nibbana, is Nirvana. That's sort of the hub of the absolute, we could say. The eye of the tornado of sorts. We'll do a couple more questions and then move on. Uh, Mary? The idea of no self and confusion, um, you know, when you don't know who you are. So on a conscious level, I, I can definitely identify with that. And then I'm wondering, I'm really just wondering if it's kind of a portal to, a, to like a deeper awareness of a deeper concept. No, it's not a deeper concept. What we're doing is we're contacting, we're, we're contacting yeah, reality. Deeper. Yeah. Okay. There. You got that one. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I misspoke. No problem. Okay. But just wondering if it, if the conscious is kind of a, can be a portal maybe. To... Yeah, the, the absence of self is a portal. It's, it's one quality of, a, of awakening of what we call Kensho and Zen. And there are three components to awakening. One is a deep experience of absence of self. One is the recognition of the absolute as being our true identity. And the third is unconditioned love. The oneness that I and everything else is the same fabric of oneness. Okay. So it's got to have the emptiness and the love both. And then the recognition, ah, oh, that's what I am. Wow. Well, can one lead to the other? Yes. Okay. There, the two portals into awakening are either through the love or through the absence, through the emptiness. The majority of people uh, enter through the absence, 
but some come in through the love, through the unity. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Stephen. You're welcome. Uh, Jed. I have a quick question regarding um, the absence of self or um, my, my friends have referred to this as ego death. Have you heard that term? Is that similar to what you're describing? Ego death would be a, a particular experience of absence of self. And in my framing, it would be that when the sense of self drops permanently. And that's, a, that's in my teaching, that's the third level of awakening that's potential. It's fairly rare, but it is a potential. Oh, huh. So here's my question. Um, if, if you are in that state of being, um, mm -hmm. is it, how do you get on with your life? It's, I mean, it seems like the, the ego is a necessary um, avatar, I guess, um, to, to get on with your daily life, with your um, coworkers and so on. That's what the personality believes, yes but it's not ultimate truth. We can function completely from absence of self. We can even function when there's no thoughts. There's an energetic impulse prior to a thought arising that is the impetus for the thought. And we can function on that level of just the energetic drink water and then the, the, the concept, oh, I'm, I'm thirsty. So we can function fully. And again, it, it isn't a question of being amoral or being without any kind of values or um, having you know, criminal intent. It's, the, the, it's part of the love. It's, a, it's an expression of the love. So I don't see you as an other when I'm in this contact with this quality. I see you as the same. You are me. So how can I cause harm to you? It's the same as harming myself. I'm I'm just wondering how that works, like in a in an office setting when you go to your nine to five job and and you are not mm -hmm. in in contact with the concept of self. How, how yeah. what, what kind of effects does that have on your daily ins and outs? Well, the students of mine that have had deep awakening experiences, most of them are still working. And virtually all of them find it easier when absence of self is present versus personality. Because personality is getting snagged, getting stuck, getting triggered, needing to defend itself. And when it's not present, a lot of those things don't land. They just pass through. I write in my book, Buddha's yeah. Heart, that the safest I ever felt was when I was fully vulnerable, fully open, fully surrendered. Because everything just passes through. There's no place for it to land. Hmm. Thank you. Great. I'll take I'll take one more question and then we'll do our break. So Brenda. My question, Stephen, is are you in a state of unself now? What do you think? I don't see that as relevant to us making contact now. I see coming from your face when you uh, recognized me and when you saw me, I see amount, an amount of um, emotion or whatever coming through. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to understand then Go, uh, piggybacking on what Jed had said, how does it work in your, even in this uh, context, mm -hmm. in the Zoom context? Right. So I don't know the answer. That's why okay. I asked. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, it's the, the propellant, the viscosity of the absolute, the viscosity of the universe is love. So if, if I'm in touch, if unconditioned love is flowing through this awareness, then how can I not feel uh, an undivided connection with you? How can I not see you as me? How can I not see me as you? So 
we absolutely can function. We can have great intimacy. In fact, we can have better intimacy because we're not looking through all of the filters, all of the prior experiences, all the hurts. Because as we've been doing our practice, part of my teaching is with the heart practices, the Brahma Viharas, we work through the personal material that, that's getting triggered, that we're recognizing in our life is getting triggered. So it's not like therapy exactly, but it's more unhooking us from the stories that are outdated and to be more and more fresh and in the moment. And eventually we end up unhooking from enough stories, primary stories, where we begin to experience freedom. And as I mentioned, the students I have that are doing this have had these experiences and are working regular jobs with regular families, all of them report that it's easier, it's less stressful, they, they get triggered less. And if they get triggered, we treat it as something to be worked. You know, if there's something that hasn't been resolved that gets activated, great, let's, let's explore. Let's see what the history is of that. Let's see if it's true. <laughs>